Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, what the lens of a photographer is able to catch, the layman might simply be missing. And what the lens of a female photographer can capture may be filled with lessons of culture and gender. There might be a lot more to what you see than you are even aware of. You're in for a visual treat on today's programme. Now, our digital producer is Omar Butter. Uh, I have seen his Instagram page. He is an amateur photographer. No sunset in DC is safe from Obsessed Omar. Obsessed with him, it's <laughs> right? true. So you're not the only fan of photography on our online community in the That's street. right. You know, our online community is actually very excited about this show, and right. they sent in a lot of questions for our guests here. But we also asked you at home to share your photos with us, along with the story behind the image. Now, keep those coming with the hashtag stream photo album. We also have had submissions from all over the world, and here are just a few of them. Now, of course, you can still join this conversation by tweeting us using the hashtag AJStream. Now, today, you're about to meet three photographers from the Rawiya Collective. The artists are part of a group who aim to challenge preconceived notions about women in the Arab world. They invite viewers to see issues their subconscious bias might be blinding them to. Some of their work is currently on a traveling exhibit around the U.S. called She Who Tells a Story. Here's a sample of work from a photographer you're about to meet. Mama, Mama, Abuni, and Lamuni, Rabuni, Yarabut Holly Baba, and Mama, Rabuni. Yarab, Shlonak, Yarab, Shlonak, and Gamalik. Are you intrigued? We'll tell you more about those photographs in just a moment. With us right here on our set, photographer Miriam Abdelaziz. In Sarajevo, Bosnia, Laura Bushnak is a Kuwaiti-born Palestinian photographer. And with us in Jerusalem, Tanya Habjok is a Jordanian-American photographer whose work you just saw a few moments ago. Tanya, what were we looking at? What were you sharing there? Um, I was on an assignment for a humanitarian organization for about mm. two months following women and children, uh, essentially, who had been left behind, whose husbands, brothers had gone ahead and journeyed across the Mediterranean and were trying to find a way to reunite with their families. And it was uh, in the refugee camps. It was in primarily in the urban refugees. And the amount of poverty was shocking as a Jordanian what I saw, and knowing Syria as I did before, what a beautiful country it was, it was uh, heartbreaking. And as a photographer, for me, the standard was the Elan Kurdi image in terms mm -hmm. of wanting it to mean something. And I was actually very dissatisfied with the imagery alone. They were sure. good images, but they weren't, I wasn't saying something that I really wanted to say. And it was actually by chance towards the end of my assignment that I stumbled upon a mother playing a WhatsApp message uh, a lullaby that the father sent from Germany and the child was distraught and she was using this message to calm the child and then I started to dig and ask mm. and and actually uh, that's how that piece came to be and it's essentially their messages back and forth children wives husbands sure and let me just remind our viewers watching that Aileen Cody was the little toddler who drowned on a beach trying to get from Turkey and then across into the rest of Europe um, Laura do you remember the very first photograph that you took that was published? Oh, wow. Think back. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. It was when I first started working with uh, the Associated Press in Beirut. We went uh, to a field in Balbak and we were taking pictures of farmers. So mm -hmm. I took a portrait of a young girl working. Yeah. That was the, yeah, that was the first picture that was published. And how did, how, how did that feel, she says, <laughs> asking the, the old cliche question. What was that like to I see your like picture published? I was a published? photographer. <laughs> yes, nailed it. Omar. So we have people in our online community who are actually, you know, talking about what inspires them to, you know, 
take the photographs that they actually take. We have yeah. Ishki here who says, I love getting pictures of people being free and happy, kids and dandelion puffs, adults playing sports. And we have Yana over here who says, I'd like to know what are the biggest challenges that they've overcome in their journey so far. I'll actually throw this to you, Miriam, just coming along to where you are now. What are some of the challenges that you actually face in your personal journey? Um, I feel that um, being based in New York City, I am uh, challenged by the talents of other photographers mm -hmm. and the amazing stories that are being told. So my biggest challenge is in fact to find uh, stories and to be able to produce them in the highest quality possible, but still uh, at the same time really following my heart and what interests me as a person. Um, I don't want to do a story that nobody cares about, only me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I want to make sure that the story can be uh, presented in its highest quality. In New York City, it's a challenge because we have a lot of amazing talents around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have one of your pictures here on my laptop. I'm going to show it to our viewers here. Do you have a signature style when somebody sees a, a picture, they go, oh, that picture's by Miriam Abdelaziz. Would you be able to recognize a Miriam Abdelaziz picture? I use a lot of natural light. Yes. Uh, I like the sun a lot. I'm yes. very attracted to uh, bright lights. Yeah. Um, I also uh, like to steal a moment, but mm -hmm. I don't like the word steal, but it's somehow what I'm doing. Like, um, so are you like sneakily creeping up on someone so they don't know you're taking the picture? No, absolutely not. The opposite, oh, okay. in fact. I'm really much uh, in their face. They know that I'm here, yeah. but I don't want them to pose for me. I want it to be oh. they're telling me their story, not me telling them. Uh, so like in that picture, for example, yeah, what's that story um, in that picture? this is a Native American reservation mm. and those kids are just playing and uh, I'm just waiting there. They know I'm taking pictures and I just take it whenever, you know, that moment happens. Yeah. Uh, Tanya, I mean, all of you have incredible awards and recognition. Um, Tanya, uh, the biggest award so far in your career has been what? I love that so far. <laughs> 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 just humble um, bright, go for it. <laughs> It was something that I never really even dared dream. I never yeah. thought that it would happen, yeah. let alone with a very personal work. Uh, it was the World Press in uh, 2014, mm -hmm. and it was uh, a life-changing, affirming moment in many ways. A lot of opportunities opened up from that, and the work traveled to a lot of places it might not have reached, that narrative. So we have a lot of people in our online community who are interested in the fact that Rawia is kind of a Middle East-based uh, you know, collective. Mm -hmm. And people, people are commenting, like Krista Blackman over here, who says, the West likes to take pictures of women's oppression in the Middle East, but rarely are women their heroes. These are photos that are meant to show us that women in the Middle East need Western help. We must save them. And right on that note, we also got a video comment from Rania Matar, who is a popular photographer up in Boston. Take a listen to what she has to say. For me, the whole um, kind of rhetoric of them and us that started after September 11, and we keep hearing on the news now, was very confusing because I am both them and I am us. I am a Lebanese and I am Palestinian. I'm American again. And for me, these identities are not mutually exclusive, on the contrary. And it was important for me to focus on that through my work uh, about girls and women, to focus on our sameness and our universality. So, Laura, I'm curious, can you identify with what Rania is saying and how much do you feel like, you know, part of your work is actually meant to dispel stereotypes that people might have about the region? Well, you know, the way I think about my work, I don't say, well, listen, I'm going to work on stereotypes and try to show a different point of view to the Western media, because then I would fall into the trap of presenting other kind of cliche images and serving some certain kind of propaganda. So when I work on my projects, I think of the audience in our region and I try to present the work for them. And I think this is how the work ends up naturally breaking mm -hmm. the stereotypes. Um, in my current uh, long-term project, which I'm focusing on Arab women and education, I try to focus on, let's say, role models or successful stories of Arab women that could inspire other women in their own communities. Sure. I mean, I think I agree, actually, with a lot of the comments that were made. And it's one of my biggest frustrations uh, is this idea. I mean, I think a lot of US foreign policy has been driven under this sort of narrative of liberating uh, the Arab woman in Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I mean, you know how that went. Um, I think that this uh, collective, I mean, I, I can also relate deeply with what Rania Matar said. She's a close friend of ours. Uh, I respect her a lot. I mean, I am half 
Texan, half Jordanian. And I am very interested in creating stories that are not, I mean, I, I, living, living and working in Palestine is one of the most overtold, hyper-narrated stories mm. with a lot of agendas. And it's hard to come up with a fresh story. But not only do I want the so-called West to, to be intrigued and get a fresh entry point into the story and consider it differently, but if the people who I photograph don't recognize themselves in the work, then it's an absolute failure. And I think that most of the Rawi, all of the Rawi are women. If you look at, unfortunately, Tamara Abdel Hadi is not with us today, uh, but her work, Picture an Arab Man, I've never seen such poignancy uh, in, in still photography in terms of bringing back the narrative and empowering that sort of the dignity of, of our men, of our brothers, of our uncles. Tanya, I, mean, it's, it's... I want to talk about a picture that we do have here, and this is one of yours, because we just had a look at it as you were talking. Tell us the story about this picture, because I know one of the things that you're doing is you're pushing back on stereotypes by showing different views of women. Tell us about this story. What do we need to know about this picture? This, uh, she's a lovely, lovely teen girl in Azraq refugee camp, which is one of the most depressing locations on, on earth. It's a newer camp in Jordan. They have the basic facilities. The Jordanians are doing, of course, the best they can. But uh, the girl is a very positive creature, you know, and she says, uh, yeah, I'm here. I've quit, you know, there's no real education for me, but I've discovered my passion. Whilst laying out every night, I look up at the stars mm -hmm. and I want to be an astronomer. So uh, I just look at that as sort of an inspiring picture, the fact that she could be that upbeat and hopeful. Maria, what are you working on right now? I'm working on a new project, which is in fact uh, based in the US. Mm -hmm. um, it's a long-term project. I've been working on it full-time for the last two months, and I realized uh, I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, it's a project that will be mainly about American identity. Uh -huh. uh, still work in progress, so I can't really What was the last picture it. you took? I took a picture of a woman, uh, a portrait of a, a woman I met um, in Texas. Yeah. Uh, it was in Austin. Yeah. Uh, she works uh, in a supermarket. She's a very strong personality. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> she wanted to be photographed in front of her favorite store, which is a video store. So she, could, I, she I, gets I, I to choose. Know. She gets to like, this is, yeah. Miriam, come here and, and take a picture of me standing here. You, she gets to choose that. She gets to choose yeah. uh, where she wants to be portrayed and who she wants to be portrayed as. Yeah. It's a project about the people and who they are. So I was kind of surprised to see that you can still go rent a video <laughs> in the US. Yeah. <laughs> I was surprised by yeah. that, yes. And it's a video player that will play it. Uh, yeah. uh, what, what do you take your pictures on? What, what's your camera that you use? Do you have a favorite camera? I do. In you, fact, my camera is it's around somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us where it is and we will get it for you before the end of this show because we want to see it. I think no, no, don't look. We, we get it. We have people. It's a, it's a Mamiya 7. It's where, where a medium it, format. Where is the camera? Um, it's out there, I think. Right. Okay, um, out there. We'll be soon Or maybe in upstairs. Here. In the Meanwhile, room. while we locate the camera, yes. Omar, which so one will take we us? We have people speaking of cameras. I mean, some people really think these things are very valuable, including yeah. Aisha over here, who says her biggest challenge in photography is making sure hers doesn't actually get stolen. Wow. But speaking of safety, we also have this uh, comment from Dana, who says you have to separate between fine art photographs and the photographers and those who are on the ground documenting conflict, very different safety issues. Laura, I know that you've actually done some conflict documenting yourself in Lebanon and Iraq. Can you talk about which kind of photography you find a little bit more fulfilling? Is it when you have more creative leeway to take pictures that you want to take, or is it when you're actually documenting real live dangerous events that are actually unfolding? No, one of the reasons why I quit my job with the French news agency is because I felt I've worked for eight years, I've got all the skills, and I felt I need to move forward. I felt like we're always telling half the story. and. The opportunity we get with documentary photography is the ability to work on in-depth, long-term projects. We have the time to research a topic, we have the time, we have more time that we spend with the subject. And it allows us to go into more details and get closer to the subject and the people we're working with. So I definitely, yes, prefer working uh, on a long-term uh, photo project. Laura, take up, tell us about this picture. It's really uh, striking. Where are we? What is going on? Oh, this picture was taken by uh, um, in Tunis, and it's uh, it's Khouloud. She's uh, politically active, part of the student union, 
And it was during a demonstration that was being held once a week in front of the Ministry of Interior in Tunisia, uh, demanding uh, to find out who killed and assassinated. Now I just forgot the name. It was a political leader, um, part of a left, uh, um, a left party. I just mm. the name. Just I cannot remember na the name. Sure. I'm sorry. Let me show you something here, Miriam. Miriam. Miriam, you actually have your camera with you now, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Show us and tell us, what, what kind of camera is that? So this is my latest little baby. Yes. It's a medium format camera. People who know photography will know it. It's a Mamiya 7. Look at, I, I don't know if you can see Tanya. Tanya was doing this <laughs> on the Skype. It's like, let me see what she's got. And uh, it's, it's a good camera in the sense that it's a medium format, which was basically means that I have like large negatives. Right. I mainly do not shoot digital. I mainly shoot uh, medium format. So and you don't uh, shoot digital. So that is actually film. Yes. That's going to be developed. Yes. And you develop yourself? No, I don't develop oh, it myself. Okay. I used to yeah. black and white, but this is color, so okay. I don't do it myself. And these okay. are the large negatives. Sure. Uh, and this is a good camera in the sense that it is film and it is a large negative, but it's still pretty handy and right. light. Yeah. Uh, it's not a very bulky camera, so it's good to travel with. So, so I know you teach and good Tanya, time. you teach. If anybody's watching this and, and they're watching you and they're really inspired, what's a, a good camera for them to actually have to use? Um, because a lot of us use our phones. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're going to be a proper photographer. Well. Oh, you do? <laughs> Laura, you, you take pictures on your iPhone? Definitely, all Ooh, the time. Okay. I love the iPhone. It's such, it's such a low profile. People get, yeah. don't get intimidated with it. So nice. sometimes it's easier then, to start with the iPhone. You get closer to them, and then you bring out the real camera. Sure. Tanya. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, I, in agreement with, with Laura, I think a lot of photographers, they get caught up on what camera and what camera. And to be honest, that's actually one of my least favorite questions Ooh. is when someone wants to talk I take to it me back about then. what's your <laughs> camera. Forget that uh, ass out. I'm, I mean, let's such talk about macho, the story. And that's a much the... question, actually actually we get <laughs> yeah, yeah let, me, let me let me show you something because our, our viewers have been sending in pictures and I, I did tell you that that Omar was the sunset king of DC this is one of my favorite ones from his um, Instagram page I'm gonna make it just a little bit bigger and it's a sunset that's reflected in the side of the car now Tanya you don't have to be kind but you you're a teacher here is that any good that picture it's stunning, and I, I, you know what? I bet you oh. he took it with his oh, wow. iPhone, <laughs> and uh, which is, which means don't focus on the equipment. Focus on what you're saying. Do you have yeah. something to say? Do you see something? It's stunning. It's a, it's it's absolutely stunning image. That's beautiful. I'm feeling absolutely amazing right. about this. This is well, awesome. Back to the community. What That's right. Back to the community. We actually have kind of an interesting question here from Sidewalk Lyrics. Um, how do you reconcile wanting to be seen and published? with wanting to authentically present what you see. I'll actually throw this to you, Miriam. Do you mm -hmm. struggle, do you try to present certain things that, you know, you think that the audience wants to see or do you actually just do things that you find personally meaningful? I, I just do things that I think are meaningful and I hope that others will think they're meaningful too. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate the idea of catering for uh, the public or the audience. I think you can lose yourself and I think once you've lost yourself as a photographer or as an artist or any kind of creative person, uh, I think, it's it's hard to find your way back. Uh, just you know, follow follow what you what you believe in, and uh, I'm sure other people will believe the same way. Yep. On my laptop here, I've, I've got the website for the Raria collection. Raria means a female storyteller. Ladies, as you w work together, are you doing that in a way to show people that you are, as a collective? A group of women who have many, many stories to tell, not just the ones that people would like you to tell. Laura. Definitely. I mean, it's the idea of the collective was to join forces and be able to show our work, create a platform where we can share. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, uh, you know, it's an alternative visual representation to our societies because it's 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 a region that we're used to having our stories to told by others, and yeah. we thought that this is a great opportunity for us to bring our stories together and create this platform for it. What are the boxes that people put you in where they say, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to jump on the, the cliches. I'm just going to ask you to tell me, what, how do people describe you, Miriam? Women photographer. Okay. <laughs> the women box. <laughs> I think I can, I can actually even see you roll your eyes when you just use that description. Tanya, how do people describe you? 
definitely woman photographer, which is somewhat insulting to be. It's, it's a bit redundant. And right. also, uh, isn't it difficult working in the Middle East as a woman? That's the most popular <laughs> question. That's the classic question, yes. How I'm you, surprised we haven't got that question so far. How do you respond to I, I No, I haven't asked I'm it, worried. but I'm just intrigued as to how do you respond to that question? Um, I don't know. It's, it's difficult. I mean... Uh, and I say, I mean, everybody's facing difficulties, let it be mm. man or woman. Mm. Uh, and how I say, because it happens that I'm working on a women-related issues, it's sometimes it's easier for me to get access to the stories I'm working on compared to my male colleagues. Mm. So we actually got a video comment from Hind who complains about something very similar. Let's listen to what she has to say. I would like to address the issue of stereotype images of women from the Middle East, and this is across advertising or art or photojournalism or cinema. And it's usually the uh, representation of the oppressed woman or the veiled Muslim Arab women. And I wish more of these images would be questioned or called out. Uh, on a personal level, I don't want my images to be seen as work by a women artist or a women artist from the Middle East or the Arab woman. Um, the work needs to speak for itself. And of course, we should celebrate female artists all around the world and celebrate their accomplishments. But these accomplishments should be based on merit and what the work stands for and not because of their gender. So on the one hand, you hear her, she doesn't want to be put in a box, but on the other hand, we have people like Hiba who tweets in, working from, from Libya, saying, in Libyan society doesn't accept seeing a woman in the field freely, only in a narrow range. I also find it difficult to communicate my thoughts and vision of art in a clear and frank manner without facing some troubles. Tanya, given the fact that ultimately being a woman and working in a specific society actually does have implications on the kind of work you can produce, how do you balance not wanting to focus exclusively on your identity with the fact that it's clearly a factor that maybe you might be unfairly put in a box in? I mean, yeah, I mean, we created a platform called Rawia, which, I mean, we sort of almost cynically, I would say, utilize the... Uh, the interest, the, the fetishism, uh, and, and created the platform based on that to get the attention, and then we used uh, that platform to push back with our with our narratives. I mean, yeah, in some of the more traditional uh, settings, I just gave a, a talk at Bethlehem University, which is, I believe, 70% uh, woman on the campus. And at the talk, it was all women. There was two men. And uh, there were two or three women that were asking questions consistently, and the ones at the back uh, were, were just very shy. And it wasn't until the class was over that they came forward and started shyly expressing their interest in photography, it's, yeah, the, I mean, okay, practically speaking, like if we look at what happened during the uh, Egyptian, uh, if we call it a revolution, whatever it was at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, there were some incidents that were horrific that I definitely wouldn't have wanted to have been a woman in that, in that situation. In general, I find it to, to have given, to help me gain access, but um, it just depends. But I, I think that photography is growing rapidly in this region. I think social media has a lot to do with it. There's a lot of self-empowerment and pushback and sort of taking back your own narrative. Let me show you something here. This is a, a picture by Laura, and I'm just going to click through here. Another one by Laura. Another one by Laura. Miriam, as you're looking at these pictures, can you tell, I know you know that, that Laura took them, can you tell a woman took these pictures? Um, Miriam, there's an Abdulaziz, another Abdulaziz. Um, uh, can you go back to, yeah. Can oh. you tell? Is there anything in a photograph that tells you, I know a woman took that picture? No. Laura's saying no. There's no way. Oh. There's no way you can tell. In fact, uh, uh, some, 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 some bodies of work, you can yeah. see that. Um, Eleonore Cauchy, for example, uh, yeah. I really like her work, and I think um, there is some feminine uh, work, but her work is more artistic and so personal. I'm going to dig into that in a little bit more because mm. we are not over yet. Miriam and Laura and Tanya, I'm taking you online to stream.aldazero.com. More visual gems to enjoy there, but before we go there, Owen, what do you have? So we're going to leave you with more photos from our community album. Keep them coming with hashtag stream photo album, and we'll see you online.
Hello again. We're speaking with photographers. I'm not using any other adjective. Mm -hmm. Photographers, award-winning photographers <laughs> here on the stream. Not using any other boxes, breaking the stereotypes. They just happen to have some kind of, uh, they resonate for some particular part of the world, but hey, just happens sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Miriam, you were actually saying that sometimes you can tell a woman has taken a photograph. Mm -hmm. Laura's like, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. But explain why you think you can. Well, I think uh, if we're talking about uh, art photography, uh, some subjects are dealt with by women in different ways. I would compare mm. it to a painting. I think some paintings, uh, depending of course which kind of paintings, but you can feel uh, the woman's energy coming out of the painting. You can you can see this is what a very feminine. What does energy look like? I don't think it looks like. I think it feels like. Oh, feels like. <laughs> course. What does it? Feel? I, I suppose it feels different to you than it does to me. Well, I would think there is a lot of softness into it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Laura doesn't agree with you. Laura, why not? I've worked as an editor with a French news agency, and after oh. a while, I would recognize certain images taken by certain photographers. But we had this conversation with my colleagues that women take pictures in a different way compared to men. And I disagree. Yeah. And I told them, listen, if I brought you 10 random images, would you really be able to say who took the picture? Was it yeah. a man or a woman? So I think yeah. it's hard to tell unless it's a very well-known photographer and they have their distinctive style. So then why are there not more female photographers? If you cannot tell that a man or a woman took this picture, you don't need to be particularly strong to hold that camera or any of the cameras that you use. Why are there not, why is it not 50-50 in the profession? We're, we're I mean, trying. It's I mean, getting there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's it's getting better. There are more and more women photographers in our region. It's also the question that we ask, are editors hiring less photographers compared to men editors? Ah. Um, we don't, there are not really good statistics about it. Maybe Tanya could help with that. Um, Tanya? I mean, if, there you look, were, if you look at the world press in terms of uh, women versus men, how many win, how many enter, it's still down fairly low. And if we go into the Middle East, I actually think there's more successful fine art women photographers right now. But I think that news, which is much more lucrative and common in terms of an accepted, uh, if you're going to be a photographer and work here, news is still more dominated uh, by men because of the situations, working late hours, going into very dangerous situations. Of course, mm -hmm. there's always exceptions, but I, I think that has a lot to do with it. But it, again, it's it's slowly, it's slowly changing. Yeah. yeah, I would say like the percentage of uh, women graduating from photo schools is rising a lot. Uh -huh. And uh, I think at least in schools, you can say like, maybe you can see like a 50-50 uh, ratio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. There's more role models coming of young yeah. ages. There's like yeah. phenomenal 22 year olds that are just breaking out on the scene and doing yeah. very original work and daring to do that and not sort of following. And I would advise that to other photographers. Don't look to people for inspiration, but don't just copy. Like, and, and there's some really exciting work coming out from young women. So I think, I think that uh, that's going to be challenged. I think the demographics are going to be challenged increasingly in the coming year. And I think, I think they also get discouraged by the fact, you know, they, we get that question, Tana, Tana and I, like, how is it mm. being married with kids? How can you balance your yeah. private life yeah. and work? I hate that question too. Do you know, did you know that I didn't actually <laughs> ask you that? Right? If, you, <laughs> if you bring it up, I think that's fine if you feel it's relevant, but I would never ask anyone that because mm. no one would ask if we had three guys on, no one would ask them that, yeah. would they? No. No, I get, I get when I travel a lot, I get like, is your husband okay with it? And yeah. I'm like, I ask him, is your yeah. wife okay with it? So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, Laura, one of, the question, one of the things that you mentioned earlier in the show was that one of the questions that annoys you the most is asking whether women in the Middle East can work and whether it's safe Ooh, for them. Oh, are you going to ask that? No, we actually have... Good job she's on Skype. Yep, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Far away from me. But we actually have got the opposite sentiment here online from Khawla, who says, On the contrary, I feel like I face less issues than men would facing doing what I do because it's odd to see a woman with a camera on the street, perhaps. I don't appear threatening, perhaps. No reporter vibes off of me. Mm. And I'm just mm -hmm. curious... I mean, does any commentary on how it's different for a woman bother you, or is, is it just particularly that question of whether it's more dangerous for women to be doing this? I mean, it, it, it depends, because sometimes you feel like we're taken less seriously because we're women photographers. Mm. 
Um, it's true, yes, people can get less intimidated by us, so we can get easier access to certain stories, but it's not always the case. Mm. So, I think it's like a, a double sword situation, like a, um, there is advantages and disadvantages. What are the advantages? Advantages is, of course, access because people are less feel less threatened by mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. So doors open, uh, people will let you do the work because they don't think you're going to do anything important with it. So in yeah. fact, it's uh, hypocrite, but it helps you get in yeah. while men will be You uh, use the prejudice to get uh, access. Exactly. Right. So you can go deep uh, in stories easily, maybe, uh -huh. uh, just because you're a woman. Uh, yeah. Women are usually like less of a threat. Yeah. Uh, but of course, like you know, if you're photographing in Egypt during uh, the uprising, there's a huge amount oh, of sexual goodness, harassment. Yeah. So sure. you know, maybe you got in and you were able to take the picture, but yeah. there's like you know, it's very much a double sword situation yeah. with advantages and disadvantages. So how do you get into the Ruiya collect? Collective. I don't think it's that easy to get into. I think it's like a gentleman's club. Are you really different? You have to know someone to get in there. All right, <laughs> ladies, dish. It's a very <laughs> exclusive group, right? Well, actually, <laughs> yes. funny, funny you should mention mm -hmm. that. We have our first new member Ooh. in years. Oh, goodness. That actually, we're going we're gonna to drop the scoop right here okay. on Al Jazeera screen. All right, screen. we're ready. We are inviting a young, vivacious uh, photographer, 29-year-old mm -hmm. uh, Tasneem Al-Sultan from Saudi Arabia, yes, who has just done a stunning uh, work on love stories of Saudi, partially inspired by her own divorce, and then exploring divorce, remarriage, um, uh, widows, and, and sort of using the platform of these women's stories to analyze uh, greater society in Saudi and sort of differences in... Uh, legal rights for women versus men but she's sure. done it in a very poetic empowering way Goodness and me. so we're very excited to tell right. the world now that this okay. is joining our collective Wow, I've just been looking up her, her name online. She's an award-winning Tassine, so um, congratulations with that. Mm. All right, so uh, Omar, where do you want to leave us? I can leave you with a comment specifically, actually, about the collective. We have mm. Gulf Photo Plus tweeted in saying, just because mm -hmm. Rawia currently consists of females, we believe this is not necessarily their raison d'être, but rather a collective of individuals producing groundbreaking work and telling important stories who, who or telling that? them differently. Who tweeted uh, that? A group called Gulf Photo Plus. Oh, okay. All right. Mohammed Sandi. That's from Mohammed Sandi, <laughs> yes. a sister and a doer in Dubai and, and is doing innovative, innovative work. Yeah, uh, like, like, I could tell it was one, like of you. <laughs> <laughs> one of your mates. It was either that or your mum. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam, Laura, Tanya, I wish you continued success. Thank you very much for being just photographers <laughs> and great <laughs> photographers on the stream. See you next time. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you.